On December 13th, 2005, Adult Swim had premiered the first episode of one of their funniest, darkest, and most surprising shows. Actually, that's not completely accurate, as they technically aired the season finale first against the creator's wishes, but I digress. Moral Oral is a stop-motion animated series created by Dino Stamatopoulos. While initially thought to be a parody of the Christian series Davy and Goliath, Stamatopoulos has stated repeatedly that the show was more inspired by Leave it to Beaver-styled 1950s sitcoms and was intended to star musician Iggy Pop. Moral Oral ran for three seasons with a total of 43 episodes, later getting a special in 2012. The show is a satire of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant communities and suburban Middle American life. When the show first began, it seemed simple enough. Sort of your run-of-the-mill goofy adult swim fair, crossed with a biting satire of religious fundamentalism. Because of this, I feel that many viewers were quick to dismiss Moral Oral, categorizing it as a dumb, forgettable late-night comedy with not much under the surface of its offensive jokes. I myself sort of fell into this category at first, catching the odd episode here and there while watching Adult Swim late at night. I remember thinking the show was very funny and certainly watchable, but I didn't feel a huge urge to seek out every episode. However, once Moral Oral had finished its run, I gradually started to hear longtime viewers of it coming out praising it as a masterpiece and talking about a dramatic shift in tone that takes place later on in the series. This got me intrigued, so in 2012, around the time of the airing of the Before Oral Oral special, I decided to bite the bullet and watch every single episode of Moral Oral from beginning to end. I can safely say that nothing could have adequately prepared me for what this dark and twisted little show had in store. Over the past year or two, I've been seeing a bunch of YouTube users ranking every episode of their favorite TV shows from worst to best. I figured why not hop onto this bandwagon to talk about a show I feel needs more attention. I picked Moral Oral as my subject as I really do feel this show ranks up there with some of the best I've ever seen. I'm aware that in recent years, the show has gotten more eyes on it, spanning several different well-written and thoughtful video essays examining the show and characters from different angles. That's great to see, but I still feel this cartoon deserves even more, so I'm going to join in on singing its praises. This video is going to contain spoilers for those unfamiliar with the show. If you haven't seen Moral Oral, I highly recommend watching it from beginning to end and coming to your own conclusions. For the sake of Moral Oral, I think it's important to start from the beginning of the series and work our way to the end in order to fully grasp the evolution of the plot and characters. For this reason, I'll be starting at Season 1 and working my way through the end of the show to its conclusion, rather than talking about it from worst episode to best. I'll give my final ranking at the end after I've talked about every episode in detail. With all that said, this is my personal ranking for every Moral Oral episode from worst to best. The series opens with the Puppington family driving through the town of Moralton, state of Soda, on their way to church. Right off the bat, we have a great introduction to both the family and the town in which they reside. Oral is a bright, cheerful, optimistic kid with a strong love for God and excitement for church. Shapey is a loud, annoying child who is possibly mentally challenged. Clay and Blaberta are strict but somewhat disinterested parents who put on fake smiles despite getting mildly annoyed with each other. Each episode of the first season of Moral Oral follows a similar formula. Oral learns a warped moral lesson from one of his elders, he goes out and causes mayhem based on his interpretation, his father Clay confronts him about it, beats him with a belt in his study, and then gives him an even more warped lesson based on what Oral has done. In this episode, Reverend Putty preaches how life is the Lord's greatest gift and how we shouldn't waste it. Oral, along with his friend Doey, go to a graveyard and resurrect the dead with the Necronomicon to prevent them from sinning by being dead. In doing so, they also take off the corpse's clothes due to the bad stench they believe is coming from the clothes. This causes a zombie outbreak in Moralton which Clay discovers is Oral's doing when he finds him undressing a corpse. He takes him to his study and beats him not for causing an outbreak, but for undressing the corpses, as nudity is a sin. He showcases this via the use of the Lost Eleventh Commandment, Thou shall be ashamed of thy natural anatomy. Liberta knits clothes for the zombies, which causes the residents of Moralton to accept the zombies as they are no longer scared of their nudity. Right away, we see how repressed and god-fearing everyone in this town is, as well as the corrupt morals they exhibit as a result. Overall, this episode is dumb fun, which gives us a good starting point for the rest of the season. If the first episode wasn't fucked up enough for ya, the second episode makes sure to up the gross-out comedy even more. Oral discovers masturbation, which his elders tell him is even worse than murder, due to it killing millions of potential children. 
in order to not waste his sperm, Oral gets the idea to keep it in a pastry bag and inject it into women who are sleeping at night. After being caught, Clay takes him back to his study and beats him for staying out after curfew. The first half of this episode is a little too talky, as Oral goes around to a bunch of different elders to seek guidance. However, the latter half of the episode more than makes up for it as we see the hilarious results of his actions. One notable thing about this episode is that it shows us Blubberta's obsession with cleaning everything and doing household chores, which becomes a defining trait of her character. You might have to have a sixth sense of humor to enjoy this episode, but thankfully I do, so it's not a problem. I definitely think as a whole, I enjoyed the second episode more than the first one and laughed quite a bit. From violence to sex to now drug use, Moral Oral makes sure to have all the bases covered right away for an adult animated series. In this episode, Oral gets a part-time job and uses his money to help the homeless. The only problem is that the homeless man he helped is actually a crack dealer and gets Oral hooked on his product. It's pretty funny to see the sweet and lovable Oral turn into a violent monster as he beats up Mr. Figurelli for more money. The ending is also great, where Clay scolds Oral for using slang and takes the crack for himself to sell. While I don't think it's quite as memorable as the first two episodes, this is still a really funny early episode with some great moments. In this episode, Oral learns from Bloberta that it's a sin to waste food and water before going on a boy scouting trip. On the trip, Oral also learns it's possible to preserve his urine if he ever runs out of food and water in the wild. Putting the two lessons together, Oral begins to drink his own pee in order to not waste it and start selling it to his fellow students on the track team. Pretty standard plot based on what we've come to expect from this show so far, but the more interesting element of this episode are the seeds it plants for the subplots that would later develop throughout the series. In particular, this episode firmly establishes Coach Stopframe's infatuation with Clay, as well as Clay's bitter disdain for his occupation. This is the first time we see Clay mutter the line stinking dead end job when he comes home from work, which becomes a running joke throughout the series. While not the funniest episode as a whole, it is still very amusing and retroactively quite an important episode while looking at the show in retrospect. Oral wants to learn how to pleasure a woman when he gets older, so he reads in a magazine that the best way to do so is by getting a piercing on his dick. Much like the previous episode, this episode continues the trend of introducing plots and characters which become more important later on in the series. This is the first time we get a glimpse at Reverend Putty's loneliness, as he opens the episode with a sermon hinting at his depression he feels seeing other men having it easier than him with women. On top of that, Oral also comes in contact with Stephanie, the owner and sole employee of a sex shop who gives Oral his piercing. Despite the questionable ethics of giving a minor a dick piercing, Stephanie herself is the first adult who genuinely seems to care about giving Oral proper advice, and the two quickly develop a friendship. Of course, Clay forbids this, saying the only reason that Stephanie is sweet and warm is because she's different from everyone else. He explains to Oral that it is important for everyone to think and act the same. The sad thing is, this probably isn't far off from how members of an extremely conservative religious community would perceive a character like Stephanie. At any rate, Stephanie makes a great addition to the cast and is a breath of fresh air for both Oral and the audience. In this episode, Oral learns that God is in everything, including himself. This causes him to believe that he also can't do anything wrong, so he ditches school and wanders around the city, letting God guide him. This isn't a bad episode, but in my opinion it's the weakest so far. It doesn't contain the over-the-top hilarity of the first three episodes, or the interesting plot seeds and character dynamics from the episodes 4 and 5. This is an episode I always forget about, even having watched the series multiple times. There is one really funny line from Clay, though. Son, imagine my disappointment when I got a call from the hospital and found you weren't sick or injured. It's Halloween and Oral has lost all sense of fear, knowing that God will always protect him. In an effort to enjoy the Halloween festivities and be scared again, Oral decides to break the Ten Commandments in order to get God angry, as he can repent his sins the day after anyway. This is another really funny episode, especially the montage of Oral going through and breaking every commandment one by one. I also really love the ending where we get a great sense of how lonely and pathetic Reverend Putty really is. There are a lot of great character moments from Doey, Tommy, and the rest of Oral's classmates as well. All in all, very solid episode with a lot of standout moments.
In this episode, Oral learns the value of loyalty, which he demonstrates by showing it to his new quote-unquote friend, Joe. Joe is an unethical bully who causes trouble and misery to all the other kids in Moralton. He and Oral travel around the town throwing rocks at cars, burning ants, and hitting unsuspecting children with baseball bats. Despite Oral feeling guilt over his actions, he goes along with it feeling he would be betraying Joe if by doing otherwise. This episode is really great for introducing Joe, who is one of the funnier characters in the series and has great development later on down the road. Another important element of the series that this episode tackles is Clay's alcoholism. Clay has been frequently seen drinking while he talks to Oral in his study, but here, we finally see how irresponsible he is with his alcoholism. He invites Doey, Tommy, and the gang to drink with him in order to reveal information about Oral. This is only the first glimpse we see at how Clay lets booze control his life and actions. But beyond that, the episode is really funny and ranks among my favorites in the first season. In this episode, Oral wants to be more mature, so he goes across Moralton observing the behavior of all the adults in town. This goes about as well as you'd expect, as we get a voyeuristic look into the fucked up personal lives of all the residents. We see Principal Fakie having an affair with Nurse Bendy, who is referred to as Nurse Blinkless by Doey in this episode for whatever reason, Mr. Figurelli having a domestic dispute with his wife, Officer Papermouth drinking his loneliness away at the bar, and Clay and Blaberta having an intense argument. Oral eventually decides to look towards his own father for guidance, concluding the best way to become more mature is becoming a depressed alcoholic. I really like this episode as the show really starts delving into the deeper emotions of the adult characters. Beyond being God-fearing, strict and intolerant, this episode showcases the deeper depression and dissatisfaction the people of Moralton feel with their lives. There's still a lot of great jokes and seeing Oral go on a bender later in the episode is really funny. Beyond that though, we're starting to finally feel a little bit of pathos for the characters, which is only going to increase as we head towards the season finale. Finally, we get to the payoff, the episode which the events of the first season have been leading up to. The Puppingtons go to church on Christmas Eve and hear a sermon about the birth of Jesus. Afterward, Reverend Putty tells Oral that Jesus is destined to return to Earth and he may already be living among us. That night, Oral hears his parents fighting over how Clay doesn't even remember conceiving Shapey, causing Oral to believe that Shapey is the second coming of Jesus. From here on, we have Oral's regular zany antics, but we also have a much deeper and darker storyline with Clay and Blaberta becoming increasingly fed up with each other, and eventually demanding a divorce. It's pretty amazing how the episode contrasts these two stories, switching from silly and comedic one moment to dark and disturbing the next. The show then breaks the formula established and doesn't end with Clay beating Oral in his study. Instead, Blaberta admits to Oral that Shapey is not really Clay or God's son, Oral becomes depressed from the knowledge that his parents are separating, and then prays to God for a divine intervention, which is implied to never happen. As stated earlier, Adult Swim decided to air this episode first, since Moral Oral was premiering around Christmas in 2005. This was both a really dumb decision since the episode develops plot lines from earlier in the season, and inadvertently kind of fitting because this episode better represents the tone of the show as a whole. All this makes the best Christmas ever by far my favorite episode of the first season. That covers season 1 of Moral Oral. While most fans consider this to be the worst season, and I would agree with them, this is still a pretty solid season of television in itself. There's lots of really funny stuff here and occasionally some really good character moments. The only episode I thought was kind of average was Omnipresence, but that still wasn't a bad episode. The rest were either good or great, with the season finale The Best Christmas Ever being fantastic. You can already feel the slow turning progression of the series with the latter half of the season becoming darker and more dramatic than the zany first half. I definitely think this was a strong season to start with, and the show is only going to improve in quality from here. On that note, let's jump straight into season 2. In this first episode of the second season, Clay and Blaberta get back together to keep up appearances, despite the fact that they clearly have no genuine love for each other. After that, Oral learns that the white Anglo-Saxons are made in God's image and that other races should be segregated. Since the only members of another race in town are the Figurellis, Oral gives the family private water fountains and bus seats as well as restricting them from certain areas. 
This inadvertently makes life more convenient for the Figurellis, causing white people to dress and act like them in order to get the same benefits. Right off the bat, we do see some changes from the second season to the first season. The animation itself is notably improved, with much smoother movements for the characters. I love stop motion animation and Moral Oral is probably the best I've seen on Adult Swim. Beyond that, the show from this point on focuses more on the town residents than before. Oral is still the main character, but instead of following him for the whole episode, there's a lot of scenes where the other characters get to breathe and interact with each other. One thing that hasn't changed, at least not yet, is that the show is still extremely funny and has great social commentary on wasp culture. Seeing segregation backfiring so badly on the racists who enforce it is both hilarious and satisfying. I really love how they all end up blaming Oral for it in the end anyway. It really goes to show that no one in the town wants to take accountability for their own actions, instead preferring a scapegoat. This episode is very representative of the show's improving quality and, with the exception of the season finale, I liked it more than any episode from the first season. Great note to start this season out with. Oral finds a stray dog which he takes in as a pet and names Bartholomew. The other residents of Moralton become envious from how much joy the dog is spreading, and Oral becomes concerned when he fears he might start to love Bartholomew more than Jesus. This is another case where we see how selfish the townsfolk are, getting enraged from the children ignoring their efforts in favor of the pure love from a dog. I personally didn't think the episode was as funny as the previous episode, but I like it even more because it's not really supposed to be. The episode ends with the residents euthanizing the dog for spreading too much love, which is really horrific when you think about it. This is also the first episode, other than season 1's finale, that doesn't end with Oral getting beaten by Clay in his study. Instead, the episode ends with Oral being sad and confused about what he was supposed to learn from all this, which happens many more times in the season. Overall, this is a really good but really bleak episode. This episode follows Coach Stopframe attempting to get closer to Clay by joining a satanic cult. There's a lot of really funny moments, especially when Coach Stopframe goes to the cult and is disgusted by how gluttonous all the members there are. I also love how he switches between worshipping God and Satan depending on which one gets him closer to his goal. On the other hand, we get a lot of perspective on how Stopframe's obsession with Clay tears him up inside and leads him to doing horrible acts. He brings Oral along with him to the cult as he's told sacrificing a virgin is necessary in order to complete the ritual. Clay and Stopframe's relationship is one of the few in Moralton where both have very genuine feelings for each other, but because of how horrible both the characters are, it also ends up being extremely toxic. Clay always leads Danielle on but won't commit due to his religious beliefs. Somehow, this makes us feel a lot of sympathy for the coach, despite the fact that he's pining after a married man and willing to get Clay's child killed in the process. It's really jarring, in a good way, how this episode shifts from being funny to sad to horrifying and makes us care about such deplorable characters. That's what makes Moral Oral so great, and this episode is easily one of my favorite episodes thus far. Oral becomes a child detective and is enlisted by Reverend Putty to solve the mystery of who stole the church donation money. This is the only episode of season 2 that feels kind of average to me. Oral is kind of out of character here, which makes sense since he's trying to play a detective. With that said, I don't personally find the detective role he's playing to be very funny. Halfway through the episode, it shifts focus to be about Oral's parents being swingers after Oral accidentally seeds Bloberta with another family. It's a really weird transition that has nothing to do with the initial plot. I like shows that change their tone if they're done organically like in the previous episode, but the way this episode transitions between tones is sloppy. This isn't a terrible episode by any means, and there are still some good lines, mostly coming from Reverend Putty. However, like last season's Omnipresence, this is an episode I usually forget about when I revisit this show. This episode delves into another character who up until this point has had a reoccurring minor role, Miss Sensordahl. In previous episodes, Miss Sensordahl has been seen picketing many establishments around Moralton, most notably the movie theater, for being unholy. Since she is doing God's work in her mind, Oral finally joins her cause in protesting various establishments in Moralton. One of Miss Sensordahl's only enjoyments outside of picketing is eating eggs, which she seems to be obsessed with, 
When Oral finds out that eggs come from a chicken's lady parts, he pickets them and gets them outlawed in Moralton, much to Miss Sensordal's dismay. This is a great episode as it shows the hypocrisy of protesting until it inadvertently backfires on the protester. I remember distinctively as a kid going to see the Da Vinci Code on the big screen and seeing protesters lined up in front of the theater. In retrospect, maybe I should have listened to them so I wouldn't have had to watch that awful movie, but I digress. Point is, the episode shows a contrast of what certain fundamentalists exhibit in public, but also how they would ultimately crack if their own conveniences were taken away from them. Miss Sensordal is a really scary character. She reminds me of someone who would fit in great with the Westboro Baptist Church. This is a great reminder that while moral oral satire is sometimes heightened for comedy in certain areas, it really isn't heightened by a whole lot. In this episode, Oral's friend Tommy starts to feel like he's stupid due to misunderstanding Reverend Putty's quote-unquote science lessons. Due to this, everybody believes Tommy to be mentally challenged, and Oral becomes his designated caretaker around school. The irony of this, of course, is that Tommy has an actual deeper understanding of real science and doesn't substitute half of his answers for God like everyone around him. This episode is another very biting satire of religion being implemented in the school system and how it can get out of hand. One thing that becomes clearer with every episode of Season 2 is that Moral Oral is not a criticism of faith or having a religion. Instead, it is pointing out how the residents of this city use their faith to justify their horrible actions and segregate those around them. Tommy is being punished for doing his own research and not blindly listening to what the adults in his life have to say. One big theme of Moral Oral in general is how the negative influence of these adults impact the children around them. In this episode, we see that in full effect and it's both pretty funny and depressing to watch. This episode is a return to the formula of the first season. Oral learns that the devil is the cause of most things which give humans pleasure, and decides to remove anything that uplifts him from his life. He finds this difficult so he compensates by inflicting pain on himself whenever he finds that something is making him happy. It's pretty funny how this situation escalates and it kind of makes me nostalgic for season 1, even though I love how the show is evolving. It reminds me in particular of the episode Maturity, in that Oral views everyone around him as wise and holy because of the fact that they're so miserable. In the end, this episode doesn't break much new ground, but it's a decent return to form that makes for an oddly fun watch. A new family called the Posebules moves in next door to the Puppingtons. They are mirror images of the Puppingtons and get along great until they find out that they say the Lord's Prayer differently from each other. This immediately causes tension and leads to the two families hating each other, with the exception of Oral and the Posebule's daughter Christina, who by nature are more open-minded. This is easily the best episode of Season 2 so far. The relationship that blossoms between Oral and Christina is extremely sweet, and it kind of evolves into a religious Romeo and Juliet style affair, with their elders telling them to stay away from each other. The guilt they feel from their feelings due to the narrow-mindedness of their parents is truly heartbreaking, and it gives us a lot of empathy for them, especially since this is one of the truly healthy relationships in Moralton. The ending of this episode when the Posebules move away is also really sad, but it leads to one of the funniest gags in the series. Shapey gets mixed up with the Posebules' son Block without the parents noticing, and Block stays with the Puppingtons from here on out. With how hilarious, sweet, and tragic this episode is, it really elevates the storytelling in Moral Oral to a whole new level, and shows even more depth to the already great writing. Oral buys a Jesus bobblehead with a really pointy face while on a school field trip. Afterward, the school bus gets into a car accident, causing the bobblehead to lodge itself into a Jewish doctor named Dr. Chosenberg. Dr. Chosenberg is brought to the hospital but is not treated, as the residents of Moralton believe his wound to be holy, since it resembles the face of Jesus. This episode is pretty funny and it kind of feels like a raunchy adult-oriented Looney Tunes cartoon. Dr. Chosenberg is actually a pretty grounded character for someone in the show. He's shown to wear a Star of David around his neck, but is also smart and very proficient with medicine. He's one of the only characters we've met that doesn't let his religion interfere with his calming logic. I couldn't help but feel sorry for his predicament even though the situations were making me laugh at the same time. I kinda wish Dr. Chosenberg appeared in more episodes, as I feel he would have made a really decent contrast to the regular cast. At any rate, his sole appearance here makes for a really funny episode. This episode marks the return of Stephanie, as she agrees to go to church upon Oral's insistence. 
After the sermon, she approaches Reverend Putty, who believes this to be a sexual advance, and agrees to have lunch with her. At lunch, Stephanie reveals that she is Reverend Putty's daughter, due to her mother stealing the Reverend Seaman from his bedside wastebasket. Much like the Lord's Prayer, this ends up being one of the more sweeter episodes of the second season. Stephanie is one of the sweetest and most sympathetic characters on the show, because she is not selfish and hypocritical like most of the other adults. Reverend Putty's arc in this episode, where he becomes more accepting of his daughter, is great too, and shows that he is one of the better adult figures in Moralton as well. His heart is actually kind of in the right place most of the time, even though his insecurities more often than not end up getting in his way. This ends up being one of my favorite episodes so far because of the great storytelling and character development. Halfway through the show's second season, I can safely say that Moral Oral has evolved from being a really good show to a legitimately great show. Oral enters a praying competition against another school, which causes him to practice constantly until he damages his joints. In an effort to relax and continue praying, he visits Stephanie, who teaches him about meditation through Buddhism. This is another episode which showcases the difference between Oral and the other residents of Moralton. While he is a devout Christian, Oral is open-minded to people who think differently than him and the value of other religious practices. I commented earlier about how the show isn't really a criticism of religion in general, and more so is directed at how these people use their religion. This is another episode which demonstrates that distinction. Oral has no problem practicing Buddhism as long as it's being used for a good cause. Clay of course disapproves and subsequently beats Oral for mixing religions. However, in an unusual turn of events, Oral ultimately doesn't take his father's advice and prays to the Buddha during the praying championship, which allows him to win. This leads to a happy ending for the episode, not because Oral won the competition for the self-interested and money-grubbing adults, but because it shows despite their best efforts, Oral is too pure to be corrupted by their dogma. This episode focuses on the ongoing affair between Principal Fakey and Nurse Bendy, which has been a consistent running joke throughout Season 2. Fakie feels guilt over deceiving his wife, but since guilt is for Catholics, he tries to find a way to repress his feelings instead. This episode really expresses the mental gymnastics the people of Moralton will go through in order to excuse or justify their actions. Principal Fagy is an incredibly pathetic man, and the fact that he's appointed as an authority figure shows how corrupt the town is. I might be sounding like a broken record, but Moral Oral further cements itself as being one of the greatest religious satires ever committed to television. I often see people who grew up in religious communities comment how accurate this show is in portraying the mentality of wasp culture, which is part of why Moral Oral hits so close to home for so many people. The ending is also great when Oral avoids learning a lesson by taking in Reverend Putty's guidance and repressing the guilt he feels. Nothing is resolved, but the episode has a facetious happy ending where it feels like something was, which is hilarious in a really dark way. After listening to the song Turn the Other Cheek repeatedly, Oral learns to be submissive in the face of violence and allows himself to be relentlessly attacked by the school bully. This concerns Oral's parents when they find out they'd have to double their laundry detergent budget, so Clay teaches Oral to stick up to himself by attacking anyone who raises a fist at him. This of course gets out of hand when Oral beats up anyone who raises a fist even innocuously, causing all of the classmates to fear him. This episode is one of my favorites so far, solely based on how hilarious it is. It's another episode that harkens back to the Season 1 formula with Oral misinterpreting a lesson and taking it to an extreme. The Turn the Other Cheek song is hysterical and complements the theme of the episode very well. It's also really funny to see Oral getting constantly beaten up with a smile on his face. The joy he takes from doing God's work outshines any of the physical pain he feels as a result. This is a classic case of the best comedy coming from Misery, which is undoubtedly a philosophy that Dino Stamatopoulos adheres to in his writing. Oral and Dowie find the quote-unquote mystical missing link from Charles Darwin's writings frozen in an ice block on a scouting expedition. After thawing him out, the missing link makes his way back to Moralton where he is forced to learn the way of Christianity. This leads to the missing link becoming a right-wing radio talk show host debating scientists on his program. The very idea for this episode makes for some brilliant comedy, as the missing link becomes a devout creationist, despite the fact he is the very antithesis of creationism. 
It's great to see how the residents of Moralton manipulate him into spreading their gospel, only to turn on him in the end when they find out he's the missing link. The ending of the episode is also great and shows a bleak post-apocalyptic future, wherein the entire country of America is now called Moralton. It's such a simple, and even a little rushed joke that shows us where the USA could end up if they're not careful. Strong comedy and satire continue throughout the second season of Moral Oral, and show no signs of slowing down. Joey feels neglected from his parents always giving him money to leave them alone, and becomes infatuated with Miss Sculptum as she passively calls him son. Because of this, Doey uses his allowance money to buy Miss Sculptum expensive gifts, and the teacher ultimately takes advantage of Doey. Meanwhile, Mr. Creepler, the ice cream man, wants to show Doey love by inviting him to take a tour of the back of his ice cream van. Doey has always been portrayed as naive and kind of slow, and this episode really delves into why that is. Kind of funny how Doey and Oral have similar personalities but for opposite reasons. Oral comes from a family of strict rules and corporal punishment, and Doey comes from a family of neglect. Doey latches onto Miss Sculptum not because she actually shows interest in him, or any affection, but because she casually calls him a pet name. This shows how desperate he is to believe that somebody cares about him. This is actually a pretty depressing episode, but there are some funny moments witnessing the love triangle between Doey, Miss Sculptum, and Mr. Creepler. Overall, this episode is creepy, uncomfortable, and melancholic, but like a lot of other episodes, that's what makes it so good and memorable. Former Christian folk music band member Mr. Armature writes a school play to be performed by the children at Diorama Elementary. The play is about the story of Jesus, and Oral gets stuck with the part of Judas, much to his dismay. This is a really funny episode, with the highlight being the I Hate You Jesus song that plays repeatedly throughout. Dino Stamatopoulos knows how to write really funny and catchy songs, as shown in this episode and in Turn the Other Cheek. Mr. Armature is a great one-off character, since a lot of his insecurity stems from him being a forgettable musician. We never see him again after this episode, which hilariously plays into that theme. While this may not be the deepest episode in the second season, it's another one that stands out for having great ideas and comedic timing. It takes a pretty typical sitcom plot for a school pageant, and brings it to new levels that only Moral Oral could achieve. Oral takes it upon himself to look for lost souls that Reverend Putty can save. Since the residents of Moralton are too righteous, Oral and Doey travel to Sinville and recruit prostitutes. Reverend Putty quote-unquote saves them, leading to Oral and Doey starting a business for the other members of Moralton to save souls. This is one of the final episodes in the series to use the classic formula of Oral misinterpreting a message and taking it to an extreme. It's one of the best episodes in that category because it's hysterical. The concept of Oral inadvertently becoming a pimp is funny enough on its own, and seeing how each of the Moralton residents use this to their advantage is great. There's also a subtle commentary about how Reverend Putty and Oral believe there are no sinners and lost souls in Moralton, when really all of the residents will sin as long as they can find a way to justify doing so. I really like episodes that take a look at the town of Moralton as a whole, and this is another one that does that in a hilarious way. It also includes probably my favorite joke from any Moral Oral episode. Uh, excuse me sir, might I interest you in having your soul saved from eternal damnation? I'm already saved, you see? I'm a Catholic! <laughs> <laughs> One aspect of the show I've glossed over up until this point is how the end credits of most episodes of Moral Oral show a scene of Oral making stop-motion shorts on his camera. This episode puts that on the forefront with Oral making animations based on the first three episodes of Moral Oral, The Lord's Greatest Gift, God's Chef, and Charity. This episode was apparently done for budgetary reasons, as it obviously cost a lot less to animate than a regular episode. Oddly enough, it ends up being my favorite episode of the second season so far, because of how different it is. Some of the best parts of the episode are the shots of the crowd reacting to Oral's movie. Halfway through the production, Joe takes over the voice acting and turns it into a comedy routine, which is also great. I said the Catholic joke from the previous episode was the funniest joke in the series, and I think the second funniest joke is at the end of this episode, when Oral realizes Joe changed the meaning of what he wrote. He, Joe completely changed the meaning of everything I wrote. Gosh, Oral, that's too bad. I guess sometimes certain things get misinterpreted. Like what? Hmm, not sure. 
This episode manages to get some of the biggest laughs in the entire series. Soak in that joy because things are about to take a drastic shift in tone. Oh boy, here we go. Clay gets the idea to take Oral on a father and son hunting trip, even though Oral doesn't want to kill animals. When out in the wild, Oral doesn't have the heart to shoot the animals in front of him, causing Clay to drink relentlessly and become angrier and angrier. When I first started watching Moral Oral from the beginning to end, I heard there was supposedly a big tonal shift from season 2 to 3, kicking off with the two-part episode at the end of the second season. In my mind, I figured, how big could this change really be? Sure, I could sense the show was becoming darker and more emotional in season 2, so I thought I was prepared. Needless to say, I severely underestimated this show. Nature Part 1 starts off with a similar tone as any other second season episode, but progressively the humor totally evaporates as the episode continues. I love how the show's score turns into wildlife ambience as Oral and Clay go hunting, giving a really unsettling and creepy vibe. Clay's alcoholism has usually been a running joke, but here we see it consume him more than it ever has before, making both the audience and Oral incredibly uncomfortable. This all accumulates in an extended ending scene with Clay spouting out every emotion from his bitter heart in an intense drunken rant. I can honestly say that that was one of the most shocking moments of television I had ever seen up to this point. It also shows a big step up in the technical department as well. I love the subtle movement of the cameras and how the scene literally gets darker with the sun setting and the reflection of the fire on Clay's face. All in all, this is one of the most powerful episodes of television I've ever seen, and we're still only talking about part one right now. And if part one wasn't dark enough, part two escalates things even further. After Oral accidentally shoots the gun he's holding, Clay becomes even angrier since the bullet broke his last two bottles of liquor. In a drunken tirade, Clay waves his rifle around and shoots Oral in the leg. This ends up being the most pivotal moment in the entire series, as Oral passes a point of no return here. He's done blindly accepting his father's actions as gospel, and finally is coming to terms with how horrible Clay has been all along. This shatters Oral's innocence, as well as our innocence as the audience, from passively laughing at Clay's deplorable behavior in the past. It really makes you feel dirty in retrospect. Clay is one of the most fascinating characters ever put on television. He's unhinged, self-destructive, and filled to the brim with layers upon layers of hate, both towards himself and the world around him. There's a great juxtaposition of the feeling of isolation that Oral has while being surrounded by nature. When Clay wakes up near the end of the episode, he reverts back to his fake cheerful self to avoid taking responsibility for his actions, but Oral's faith in him is completely destroyed. Liberta sums it up pretty well at the end of the episode by saying that that was Clay's true nature coming out. Overall, I might like the first part of nature slightly more than the second part due to the level of shock the initial episode elicited, but both parts of this insane finale are among the best episodes of television I've ever seen. How did these episodes affect the tone of the show during its final and third season? Soon we will find out. But before we do that, let's talk about season 2 as a whole. Season 1 was really funny and in my opinion even a little underappreciated by the show's fans, but season 2 is undeniably a huge step up in quality. Much like the first season, there was only one episode in season 2 that I felt a little bit underwhelmed by, with the rest either being great or spectacular. In my opinion, this is the season where Moral Oral cemented itself as more than a great show and transcended into being one of the best shows in Adult Swim's history. Not only is the animation noticeably improved, the comedy much funnier and the satire all that much more biting, but this season adds an extra layer of depth to the characters not previously seen, with the exception of the season 1 finale. Moral Oral is like an ogre, it has layers. This season slowly peeled off some of those layers during its 20 episode run, and it was incredible to watch. Breaking away from the established formula of season 1 allowed a lot more time for the residents of Moralton to breathe and be fully realized. This gave us many characters that were not only funny but sympathetic at times. You can definitely see a slow turning wheel in the show's tone, which takes a total nosedive in the two part nature finale, which are my favorite episodes in the season. And if you think the show can't maintain that level of quality going forward, then fasten your seatbelts because we are far from finished. In fact, in a way, we've barely scratched the surface. Now we're getting into the show's payoff and see where it's all been building up to. Without further ado, this is Moral Oral Season 3. This episode follows Bluberta's story while Clay and Oral go on their hunting trip. After finally realizing that Shape and Blocky have been switched, Bluberta goes to switch them back, only to end up with both of them. 
After this, she attempts to have affairs with several men in Moralton, who turn her down. Liberta then purchases a high-powered electric dildo which mutilates her vagina. She starts to impress Dr. Potter's Wheel who has a gore fetish and subtly encourages her to continue mutilating herself. I want to state right now that none of what I just said was for the sake of comedy. There is one joke in this episode about a guy named Mr. No Hammers who tries to sell hammers. That part is hilarious, but that's it. The rest of this episode is dead serious in tone as we see Bloberta constantly try and fail to feel some sort of connection with someone. This episode really shows how animation can reach new heights dramatically. It manages to take a story of a woman mutilating herself with a gas-powered dildo drill and evoke sympathy without feeling over the top. The episode concludes with a first-person shot of Clay walking around his house, showing how amazing the animation has become at this point. Especially by the standards of a mid-2000s Adult Swim show, Moral Oral looks really phenomenal. The final shot of this episode with Clay and Blaberta lying in bed has forever been burned into my cranium as one of the most depressing shots I've ever witnessed. You really feel like all the life has been sucked out of them and not because they're puppets. The use of the Mountain Goat song No Children is really effective here as well. The Mountain Goats make a couple of other appearances in Season 3's soundtrack as well, and I have Moral Oral to thank for introducing me to that great band. The nature episodes were the show's turning point, but Numb confirms that there's no going back now. The end result is an extremely powerful episode that sets us up for what we need to expect with this final season. Taking place four weeks before the hunting trip, Clay punishes Oral not by spanking him with his belt, but by grounding him from going to church. This sends Oral into a psychotic frenzy with him turning into a golem-like creature obsessing over church. Much like the previous three episodes, this episode brings the storytelling, animation, and character depth to new heights. The mood and atmosphere is fantastic, and this episode feels more like an animated horror short than a comedy or even a drama. That said, the episode does have some genuinely funny moments here and there, especially some of the dialogue and actions Oral takes after his mind snaps. The music in this episode is great too, and it really enhances the mood and the dark and trippy storytelling. The credits of this episode are also great showing us still images of Clay's mental collapse in the nature episodes, in contrast to Oral's mental collapse in this one. Even after completely changing its overall tone at the end of the last season, Moral Oral finds new and creative ways to surprise and engage its viewers. This episode takes place one day before the previous episode, and immediately after the events of School Pageant. The adults of Moralton come to the uncharacteristically introspective realization that they might actually be responsible for giving Oral bad advice. They collectively decide to avoid Oral with each adult shifting responsibility onto one another, leading to the same destructive results as usual. This episode is the closest in tone to the second season as we are going to get from here on out. Having this episode take place one day before the previous episode is brilliant because it shows that Clay and the other adults in Moralton have learned nothing from their initial realization of being bad influences. Season 3 in general plays with time a lot and gives more context behind a lot of what we saw in the first two seasons. This is why, as I stated at the beginning of the video, it is important to start Moral Oral from the beginning of the show and work our way through the episodes in order. I wonder if anyone has mapped out the show chronologically on a chart online. At any rate, this is a really funny episode that adds some much needed levity to the show's third season. This episode takes place during the events of the hunting trip. We follow the stories of Nurse Bendy, Miss Sculptum, and Miss Sensordoll as they deal with the traumas of sexual abuse they experienced in the past. What unfolds is one of the darkest and most grotesque episodes of television ever produced. This episode is infamously the one which got Moral Oral cancelled, as the executives at Adult Swim deemed the show too depressing to continue airing. The official description for this episode on Adult Swim's website literally reads, The final nail in the show's coffin. Despite this, the episode aired exactly as intended, with all the graphic details kept fully in place. While I wish Moral Oral ran longer, I have to give some serious props to Adult Swim for airing this episode as intended. Whenever I rewatch this series with my friends, I love seeing their jaws drop on the floor when we finally get to this particular episode. It is one of the ballsiest pieces of art I've ever seen, and easily ranks among the most impactful and depressing episodes in the series. While it's not my personal favorite, it is the best episode to demonstrate the shift in tone between the first two seasons and this one. A lot of people have talked about this episode in depth, so instead of doing a deep analysis, I'll instead point out something that I haven't heard anyone else talk about. If you pause and look at the newspapers on Miss Sculptum's mirror before she tears them down, you can see one of the headlines reads, Serial Rapist is on the loose. This time it's not oral. 
That is by far my favorite easter egg in the show, which is kind of ironic since this episode takes place on Easter. Beyond that, this is pretty much the ride or die moment that's likely going to grab the viewer's attention until the end of the series, or scare them away from ever watching it again. As a member of the former camp, I can safely say that at this point I was completely hooked and ready to watch this incredible train wreck unfold. This episode expands on Doey's loneliness felt as a result of his parents' neglect. Taking place one week before the camping trip, Doey becomes bitter from seeing the loving relationships experienced from other kids and their fathers. When Doey sees Oral failing to shoot targets with his gun out of nervousness, Clay states he may end up taking Doey with him instead. This causes Doey to make Oral even more stressed as he attempts to become Oral's replacement. This is the only time in Moral Oral where we see Doey acting extremely vindictive showing how much the neglect he felt from his parents has affected him. This is another episode which has a lot of funny moments, mostly stemming from the destruction Oral causes by accidentally shooting his gun. It is also simultaneously very depressing, as we see Doey deal with his deep-seated depression and resentment towards the world around him. There's no real resolution to the episode other than Clay finally revealing he would never have actually taken Doey with him, which leads to an ending that's both funny and depressing. It's a great mix of comedy and tragedy, which Moral Oral excels at doing. This episode takes a look at the home life and the complicated family tree of Joe. It takes place over several weeks, starting after the events of School Pageant and ending slightly after the events of Nature. We see Joe's father, Dr. Second Opinionson, is an old and senile man, and Joe's mother apparently died during childbirth. However, Coach Stopframe tells Joe that his mother is actually Nurse Bendy. Joe seeks her out and we see a relationship between Joe and Nurse Bendy blossom. This actually ends up being one of the sweeter and more wholesome episodes of Season 3. Not only do we finally get to see Joe soften up towards someone, but we also see Nurse Bendy outgrow the fake family she constructed for herself in the episode alone. Even if I'm not sure this is what the plan was all along, it's a great and surprising way to bring two character arcs together. The chemistry between them is great, and this episode also manages to be very funny, due to Joe being a really entertaining character. It's nice to be reminded that for some characters, there is a bright light at the end of the darkness. This is a flashback episode that delves into the reason why Clay and Blaberta got married in the first place. It is told from Blaberta's perspective of being the last single woman in her friend group, and being left out of her own family's activities. Much like everyone else in Moralton, she's isolated from society in her own way. This changes when she meets Clay Puppington at church and decides to manipulate him into marrying her. This episode really puts into perspective the entire dynamic Clay and Blaberta have throughout the course of the show. I love how Blaberta introduces Clay to alcohol because she thinks it'll make him a better person due to her father drinking. It goes to show what a dangerous effect alcoholism can have on someone when it's glorified. The best part of the episode are the pictures of their wedding during the credits set to the Mountain Goat song Old College Try. It really solidifies that their marriage was doomed from the very beginning, and it didn't take long for their self-destructive and toxic behavior to get out of hand. There is a definite commentary in this episode of people who rush into marriage out of social pressure and loneliness, which becomes a retroactive commentary on Clay and Bobberta's entire relationship. It's truly amazing how much this show gets me to care about these little puppets that are so horrible to each other. Another flashback episode, this one delving into Clay's childhood and relationship with his parents. Clay's mother spoils her only son and totally neglects Clay's father, causing tension among the family. While looking through the family photo album, Clay's mother reveals she had 10 miscarriages before Clay's birth, causing Clay to become bitter and jealous. This causes Clay to play a prank where he pretends to kill himself, which gives his mother a heart attack and kills her. Upon his mother's death, Clay's father raises his hand at Clay to smack him before telling him that he's not even worth it. This causes Clay to associate worth with physical punishment, which mirrors his actions in the present beating Oral in his study. The end of this episode also shows that Clay thinks about these traumatic events a lot while he's drinking. From the moment I knew that this was going to be an episode about Clay's childhood, I was expecting something really dark to happen. Needless to say, this episode more than delivered on that expectation. I have to admit upon first viewing, this is the episode that finally broke me and made me cry while I was watching it. Not only does it explain the entire relationship between Oral and Clay, 
but it also commences on the cycle of violence occurring between different generations of a family. Clay may be a deplorable monster, but this episode manages to demonstrate why and how he is the way he is, and makes us empathize with him without justifying his actions. All of this manages to make Passing my favorite episode of the series so far, and it stands as one of the most emotionally moving 11 minutes of television I've ever seen. This is an episode that follows Oral, Christina, Stephanie, and Reverend Putty. In other words, most of the actual likable residents of Moralton. A few weeks before the hunting trip, Diorama Elementary is hosting the school's annual arm's length dance. Oral is reluctant to go, but is talked into it by Stephanie, who had a traumatic experience at the dance in the past. This episode is half set in the present and half flashbacks to Stephanie's experience at the arm's length dance. This really takes a look at why Stephanie is so isolated after being led on by Doey's mother, Kim. Out of all the adults in Moralton, Stephanie is the only one who would take a traumatic event like this and actually attempt to turn it into something constructive. It is because of her that Oral and Christina finally reunite despite the wishes of their parents. Much like Dumb, this is one of the sweeter episodes in this season that actually has a happy ending for the characters involved. I love seeing both Oral and Christina together, as well as Reverend Putty and Stephanie bonding. The ending also implies that Reverend Putty has actually grown to be more tolerant, accepting his daughter's lesbian lifestyle. While this episode is still dark and depressing at times, it's once again nice to know that at least a few of these characters have genuine chances at happiness and redemption. This episode follows two of the previously unnamed background characters who we come to know as Florence and Dottie. Although both of these characters have always been seen at Reverend Putty's sermon, they have had little dialogue or relevance up until this point. Now we finally get into the backstories of what they were doing every Sunday. Florence is an overweight woman with a huge crush on Reverend Putty, whereas Dottie is a stuck-up beautiful woman who always berates Florence at every turn. After they both leave their husbands, Florence and Dottie move in together at the Alone For It apartment building. Anyone who has had a shitty toxic friend in their life can relate to Florence putting up with Dottie's insults. Florence's ex-husband is Officer Papermouth, who we've also occasionally seen throughout the series. I really like how Moral Laurel expands on the backstories for characters we weren't even consciously thinking about. It really makes the town of Moralton feel alive and makes us care for all the residents in this bleak, downtrodden town. Finally, we get to my favorite episode of Moral Laurel. This is the first episode that takes place almost entirely after the events of nature. It also takes place mostly in one location, aside from the opening and the end of the episode. Clay misses church on Easter Sunday and goes to get drunk at Forgetti's. After Reverend Putty finishes his sermon, he, Officer Papermouth, and Dr. Potter's Wheel join Clay at the bar. The episode is pretty simple in concept. Clay gets drunk, antagonizes all of the other patrons at the bar, and spills out every single bitter emotion in his heart, kind of like his rant in nature. What really elevates the episode to new heights are two things. Firstly, the voice acting is phenomenal. Scott Adsid gives not only his best performance as Clay here, but also one of the greatest performances in the history of voice acting. I don't make that claim lightly, and anyone who has watched this episode knows exactly what I mean. Secondly, the writing here is masterful. Moral Oral has elicited a plethora of different emotional responses from the audience, but this episode is the most grounded and real. Many of the other episodes, like Numb and Alone, use exaggerated scenarios to reach new heights with their storytelling. It worked in those cases because the disconnect between animation and reality allows for situations that would be considered over the top in live action. In Sacrifice, the episode is very dialogue-heavy and contained, making it hit hard since it resembles a situation that could unfold in real life. The monologue Clay gives near the end of the episode is one of the most gut-wrenching and powerful speeches I've ever heard. Scott adds it deserves some retroactive award in delivering that speech. The end of the episode is also really tragic, as Clay attempts to get punched only for the three men to abandon him, mirroring the same situation that occurred between Clay and his father. This is not only the best episode of the series for me, but could be arguably ranked as the best single piece of television I've ever seen. It is an amazing, deep, and powerful study of one of the most fascinating characters found in any form of media. One of the weirdest and most confusing episodes of the series, this episode follows Miss Sensordal's plot to overtake Moralton, as first seen in the episode alone. It jumps back in time to the events of nesting, with Oral going to the mayor to outlaw eggs. In one of the show's greatest reveals, we find out that the mayor of Moralton is none other than Clay. Here it is revealed that Clay has developed an Oedipus complex for his long-deceased mother, which causes him to outlaw eggs in disgust of himself. 
Later in the present, Miss Sensordahl is campaigning against Clay for the mayor position, using Oral and the hunting accident as a way to bring Clay down. This is a decent episode, as weird as it is, but it does suffer slightly from these stories never being fully fleshed out. The episode ends with Miss Sensordahl throwing the election and manipulating Clay into being under her control. Unfortunately, due to Moral Oral getting cancelled, we never see the results of these actions come into fruition. Despite this, this episode still makes for an intriguing, albeit hard to follow, character study for both Clay and Miss Sensordahl. The latter is really controlling and manipulative, and since Clay is so insecure, she knows how to fuck with him efficiently. It does make me wish that this relationship was expanded upon more before the show's cancellation, but as it stands, there's enough here to work with for an intriguing episode. Here we are at the finale, at least of the original series. Much like the end of the first season, this episode is set on Christmas. Oral feels guilt over the fact that he no longer honors his father, which is a sin. He seeks out Coach Stopframe to find out what's worth honoring about Clay. After witnessing Clay kissing Miss Sensordahl, Coach Stopframe too has lost all respect for the man. Oral and Coach Stopframe then spend the day together doing festive activities as they both try to figure out what's good about Clay. For as horrible of a character that Coach Stopframe has been up until this point, this episode manages to redeem him a little bit. The bond that he and Oral share is really quite touching, and it's great to see them uplift each other after being traumatized by the same person. This leads to Coach Stopframe finding a beautiful answer to his question. For all of his faults, Clay made Oral, and that's worth honoring. The series ends with a flash forward to the future, where we see Oral has married Christina and has raised a loving family. Although this episode was not originally intended to be the series finale, it manages to work so well with the themes of the episode. Oral successfully ended the Puppington cycle of toxicity and raised a much better family than the one he grew up with. Clay failed to shape his son into being the miserable and bigoted man that he turned out to be. This is the perfect end to Oral's character arc and leaves the viewer with a strong sense of hope. We can't change the past, but we can make the future better. And there's no better person to accomplish this than the compassionate, loving, and truly moral Oral. And that's the end of the third season. Sort of. Let me explain. When Adult Swim ultimately cancelled Moral Oral, they also reeled back the initial order of 20 episodes for the third season to 13 episodes. This left seven fully written scripts unproduced. One episode that was not only written but voice acted was an episode called Abstinence. After the series cancellation, two of the show's staff members finished the episode for free. The finished product used crude animation since they no longer had access to the puppets. In May of 2015, the episode was finally released to the public on YouTube. Since this was originally intended to be part of Season 3, I'm going to include this episode in the discussion of this season. Doey becomes a certified cock blocker working to keep Dr. Phonycroft's chickens from reproducing. Once eggs are outlawed in Moralton, Doey is laid off, leading to Miss Sensordahl to hire Doey to prevent adults in Moralton from having sex. This episode actually ends up being one of the more comedic episodes of Season 3, and feels similar to a Season 2 episode in tone. There are some really funny lines, and the episode plays with time jumps like many of the other Season 3 episodes. It's also nice to see Doey as a sweet kid again after delving into bitterness in the episode Trigger. The animation is crude but serviceable, and it makes me wish that the other unproduced episodes of Season 3 received the same treatment. While Abstinence doesn't rank among the best episodes in the third season, it's still quite a solid episode, and I'm glad it finally got to see the light of day. With that, we finish Season 3. I commented how at the end of Season 2 that that season elevated Moral Oral into being one of Adult Swim's best shows. Season 3, in my opinion, is where it earned its gold medal and actually became Adult Swim's best show. The writing here is deep and powerful, the animation is incredible, the voice acting is superb, and the soundtrack is awesome. The amount of depression and empathy I felt for the characters was unlike anything I had ever experienced up until that point, or even to this day. It actually may have hit a little too close to home in a lot of respects. I remember being depressed for several days, if not weeks, when I first watched it as a teenager. With that said, I wouldn't change Moral Oral Season 3 for the whole world. Well, unless we were to get the other episodes that didn't air. This is quite possibly the best season of television I've ever seen, and for me personally, it turns Moral Oral into the most emotionally moving adult animated series ever made. As much as I love Bojack Horseman, Futurama, Duckman, and a lot of other animated shows that delve into really dark territory, Moral Oral manages to top them all in its third season. But before I can wrap up this video and rank all the episodes, there is one more Moral Oral episode to talk about. 
In 2012, a half-hour moral oral special aired on Adult Swim. The episode, titled Before Oral Oral Trust, takes place back when Oral was four years old. This episode covers Oral learning about God for the first time, the birth of Shapey, and the relationship between Oral and his grandfather. One of the many cut plot lines of season 3 was that Oral's grandfather was going to move in with the Puppington family. Thanks to this special, we get an idea of what the relationship would have been like. The episode itself is a lot less dark than much of season 3, and has a sweet and heartwarming tone. There are some really funny lines and moments as well. As much as I love it when the show is dark and taking itself seriously, I'm glad that Dino Stamatopoulos remembers that Moral Oral is also one of the funniest shows ever made too. Visually, Before All Oral is noticeably the best that the show has ever looked so far, with fantastic lighting and animation throughout the special. All in all, this is a really beautiful way to continue Moral Oral's legacy, and I'm really happy Adult Swim had decided to air Before All Oral. Even though Honor ended Oral's story pretty perfectly, this proves that, due to the way that this show often jumps around with time, there's much more to explore with the residents of Moralton. It makes me wish that Before All Oral was a mini-series as opposed to one standalone episode, but a sign of great art is when it leaves you wanting more, and not less. So with that covered, we finally come to the end of reviewing the Moral Oral episodes. I will say, Dino Stamatopoulos has publicly released the scripts for the unproduced episodes Raped and Narcissism. I didn't include them on this list because unlike Abstinence, they weren't voice acted or animated, so it didn't feel right comparing them to the rest of the episodes. I will however leave a link to the scripts for those episodes in the description of this video. I encourage you to go read them when you can. Hopefully Dino Stamatopoulos will release more of the scripts for unproduced episodes at some point, although I'm not sure how many of them are fully written. I personally would even buy them if he included them in a book or something. With that said, it's time to reveal my personal rankings for the actual produced episodes of Moral Oral, from least favorite to favorite. Here we go. Number 45, Elemental Oral. Number 44, Omnipresence. Number 43, Waste. Number 42, God-Fearing. Number 41, Charity. Number 40, The Lord's Greatest Gift. Number 39, God's Chef. Number 38, The Blessed Union. Number 37, Loyalty. Number 36, God's Image. Number 35, Pleasure. Number 34, Love. Number 33, God's Blunders. Number 32, Holy Visage. Number 31, Repression. Number 30, School Pageant. Number 29, Praying. Number 28, Courtship. Number 27, Geniuses. Number 26, Maturity. Number 25, Presence for God. Number 24, Offensiveness. Number 23, Satan. Number 22, Abstinence. Number 21, Turn the Other Cheek. Number 20, Innocence. Number 19, Nesting. Number 18, Be Fruitful and Multiply. Number 17, Trigger. Number 16, The Lord's Prayer. Number 15, Oral's Movie Premiere. Number 14, Dumb. Number 13, Grounded. Number 12, The Best Christmas Ever. Number 11, Sundays. Number 10, Close Face. Number 9, Before Oral Oral, Trust. Number 8, Help. Number 7, Honor. Number 6, Numb. Number 5, Alone. Number 4, Nature Part 2. Number 3, Nature Part 1. Number 2, Passing. And number 1, Sacrifice. Clearly my list favors the later seasons of the show, as I'm sure many Moral Oral fans would agree. However, keep in mind, there was only a couple of episodes I thought were kind of average, with the rest being at worst very good, and at best being animated masterpieces. Moral Oral is possibly the most impactful show I've ever seen, and sticks out distinctively in my memory ever since I finished watching it around a decade ago. As time goes on, more people have started to recognize how special this show was and why it deserves to be hailed as so groundbreaking. I feel with the success of BoJack Horseman, more people are open to dark animated tragic comedy shows that really make us feel for the characters while we laugh. Also like with BoJack Horseman, it's pretty easy to misunderstand Moral Oral's intentions if you only watch one or two episodes. Both shows start out as your prototypical animated comedy series before delving into some really dark territory. I'm not sure the world was ready for Moral Oral back in the mid-2000s. Adult Swim evidently felt so as well based on the decision to cancel the series prematurely. 
Thankfully, they still gave us enough to work with, cementing Moral Oral as one of my personal favorite television shows ever. If you haven't seen it yet, I highly suggest to seek it out and give it a watch because it really deserves all the attention in the world.